So welcome. Uh, and as would be polite when your bosses introduce you, thank you, Steve, for those kind words of welcome. It's very uh, nice of you. And thank you to you for making the time to come out on what is a fairly dreadful uh, evening when the Christmas shops are uh, calling towards you. Um, I won't introduce myself a second time. Steve has done that very well. The conversation this evening is going to look at the topic of strategy, which in my estimation is the most important subject you could possibly study. Um, other charlatans and snake oil salesmen will tell you that their subject is more important, but they are lying. Strategy is the critical discourse, whether it's in relation to nation state politics or <coughs> organizational issues, or even just down to your individual strategy for getting through your own life. I thought I should start today with a disclaimer, um, which I'll put up uh, as I'm welcoming you. Those of you that have come for the uh, drinks reception afterwards and who are gutted that the Scottish Government has lowered the drink driving limits, uh, the disclaimer deals with that. Um, and over the course of this evening, I will pick out a handful of companies and talk about their strategic behaviour over recent years. And I would just like to point out for Steve's benefit that I will personally take any liability for anything I say about any organisation. Harriet Watt is not to be held responsible for my personal views. And I should also start by making some acknowledgements. I have been an academic uh, for 20 years. Hard to believe. I know I must have been a child bride. I'm sponsored by Nivea. <laughs> but I have been an academic for an extended period of time, and most of that time, I have had the privilege of working with some very talented people, often much more talented than me, and I prefer to write and think and engage in my research collaboratively, and so I want to acknowledge the <coughs> wide group of people that I've worked with, in particular my colleague and friend Donald McLean, who is based at University of Glasgow, and my other uh, co-author of regular repute is uh, Professor Nick Beach, who's at Dundee. But there's a whole range of people from the States and mainland Europe and the Far East that I have had the chance to work with. And so I will say the word I in relation to my thoughts about strategy this evening, but quite often I really mean we, so you'll forgive me for that. Um, one of the things that happened when I was asked to do this inaugural is that Alex Jacob, who I should thank very kindly, and Tony Weir for helping organise this evening, said to me, you should make it personal. You know, try and make it in some way autobiographical. Oh my goodness, that sounds difficult. Especially with my wife and children sitting there, this could get very difficult. But I decided to take up the challenge. So here is a bit of autobiographical detail from my life. This is a copy of the first student evaluation it's now 20 years old, this piece of paper, of me as a lecturer. And it, uh, it's the opportunity for our paying customers to say, deal or no deal, hold up their Strictly Come Dancing paddles and give you a rating. And in this very first batch, in small print at the bottom, it said, <laughs> I, I would draw your attention to the small matter that they say, you know, I would go to this lecture for help, confident and self-assured. All of the things are positive, but you know, really, in sartorial terms, time to invest in some ties. It's taken 20 years to close the NSS feedback loop. <laughs> and this is a one-time only deal, but I am wearing a tie. Much of this evening's conversation will be drawn from this book, which uh, is coming out next week, just in time for Christmas. It would make a lovely gift, really. <laughs> um, there are, however, only three copies of this book in circulation on the planet which indicates that my publisher has seen my previous sealed record <laughs> and thought better than just going straight to the bargain books bucket. Let's just print three copies. He'll buy a couple. That only leaves us one to shift. <laughs> Two of those copies are with us this evening. And you will have the opportunity to win one of these two copies, in fact, both of these copies over the course of this conversation, meaning there's one remaining copy locked in a vault somewhere. It's surely got to attribute some value given that it's only one copy left. Um, so most of what you will find over the course of this evening's conversation is embedded in that book, which, as Steve indicated in his opening comments, is drawn from about 20 years of working with a whole range of organisations, some of which are in the room this evening, to think about strategy. I describe my research interests to people who are not strategy researchers 
as I'm interested in what people are doing when they say they're doing strategy. So I've studied things like away days and workshops, as well as strategic documents and plans. I'm interested in who speaks to who, which kinds of documents are produced and so on. And again, to pick up on Steve's opening comments, one of the reasons I was attracted to this university as a relatively recent, we can't be too precise for tax purposes, um, <laughs> but sometime in the last decade I joined this institution <laughs> on the basis that I was actually very impressed by the university's strategic plan. And over the course of this conversation, I'll go on to demonstrate to you why I was impressed. The book opens with this quote from Robert Burns, I am nothing if not a passionate uh, uh, fan of our country. So here is Scotland's bard saying, the best laid plans of mice and men gang after glee. Which echoes something that Steve said, which uh, that, you know, it's all very well to develop a plan, but the lived reality of delivering that plan is often significantly more complicated and things rarely work out as planned. The academic research literature on strategy suggests a failure rate somewhere in the region of 80%. That's quite a stark recognition that we do less well at this than one would expect. For those of you that were really only here for the free drink afterwards and are still fizzing about the drink driving regulation, when Robert Burns reappears in 30 or so minutes, it'll be time to go. So that'll, you could nudge your colleagues and they'll wake up. Okay. I plan over the course of this evening to answer these five questions. We'll start with what is strategy itself? How do we define strategy? We'll ask ourselves, how do you go about building them? I'll walk you through a process that uh, myself and my co-author, Donald McLean, developed over several years. I'll ask, why would you bother developing a strategy in the full knowledge that 80% of the time it doesn't work out as planned? Why on earth would you spend your time doing that? We'll try to explain that. We'll ask the question, are all strategists the same? And we'll close by asking, what precisely is it that strategists do? I said earlier, I'm interested in what strategists do when they say they're doing strategy. And so I'll try to explain what it is I think that they do. So let's start with question one. I've asked this question of a very large number of student groups, executive groups, managers and in interview settings, businesses that I've been working with. These are a collection of the things that come up. If you're thinking of an answer yourself, just ask yourself whether any of these things come up. These are the kinds of things people say strategy is about. Of course, as an academic discipline, there's several definitions out in play, but mostly people agree on something around it being some form of plan or route map that is in some way taking you somewhere you want to get to. So it usually talks about targets, mission, vision, objectives. And it typically is seen as relating to the longer term. Longer term is, of course, a question which varies from industry to industry and sector to sector. Longer term for a computing software gaming company might be six months. Longer term for somebody in mining and exploration like our current chancellor might be decades. But broadly, there's some consensus around those kinds of things. Here's our definition of strategy. Strategy is the craft of collectively rising to a significant challenge and accomplishing more than might be reasonably expected. As a diagnostic, you can tell when there's a strategy in place because unexpected things happen. David, the shepherd, faces Goliath, the hardened seven foot tall warrior, and wins. I'm learning Greek, as my Greek colleagues know. In 2004, Otto Rehegel, the German football coach took a fairly poor Greek national team and won the European Championships. Scotland tried to mimic this by thinking the secret is obviously to have a Scottish football coach and hired a certain Bertie Volts. It didn't go so well. Okay. An early 20s Bill Gates dropout from an IT program at MIT should not have been able to dislodge IBM from its dominant position in the computing industry, and yet it did. And when you see those kinds of unexpected outcomes, it means that there's been a strategy at play. Somebody has found a way of configuring the encounter in ways that are helpful. David could have challenged Goliath to a Sudoku challenge on the basis that that might be the fairest way of settling the battle between the Philistines and the Israelites. 
But that wasn't on the table because Goliath's no mug. He knew that wouldn't work. He decided to challenge him to a fight, but what he did not see coming from about 40 yards was the small stone that hit him allegedly smacked between the eyes. David was strategic. Okay. So let's start with a competition. Pfft, audience participation. Okay. I'm going to flash on the screen a uh, sequence, and it'll be on the screen for precisely 30 seconds. And I'd like you, without the aid of your smartphone, to take a picture of it or a pen to write it down to try and memorise the sequence. And in 30 seconds' time, we'll see who's got the best memory in the room. And the best memory in the room will win one of only three copies in existence <laughs> of a soon-to-be best-selling book. Given that if one in three of them sells, that's best-selling for me. This is pretty good, OK? So are you ready? If you find anybody else in the audience who's cheating, writing it down, you're, feel free to uh, oust them from the room, OK? Here we go. Think you've got it? Confident? I mean, a lot's at stake here. Well, not least my children's Christmas presents, right? OK, so what we're going to do is I'm going to ask you to raise one hand. You, you can't vote twice, just one hand. Ambidextrous, it doesn't matter which. I'm going to put it back up in a second, and I'd ask you to keep your hand in the air. You can wave it like you just don't care if you want to. But keep your hand in the air as we walk from left to right across the screen, and we'll see who's got the best memory uh, from the group, okay? Clear? So let's start. Um, hands in the air, incidentally. This has to work like this, right? And we'll just be... The psychologists say you should be able to remember about seven things. So if we fail at seven, feel free to fake it, right? It's, it's okay. If you didn't get the letter U, for example, really, it's, it suggests some underlying problem that you might struggle with. Um, <laughs> so keep your hand in the air if you've got U, then I, then B, then O, then L, then H, then P, then a second P, and drop your hand when you begin to lose it, okay? E, O, F, T, second T, J, X, B, we're down to our last few. There's one here and one here. Where do we get to? B, T, O. You simultaneously failed at the same point in the lecture. In which case, we'll have to do a randomizing uh, device to decide who wins the prize for best memory, because there's, there's only two copies in existence in the room. <coughs> Heads or tails, young man? Um, tail. Tails. There's our lucky winner. <laughs> so you win a copy of the book. I will get a copy sent to you, OK? I'll pass that back to me. Now, I'm going to put another sequence on the board <coughs> for less than a second and rerun the same experiment, see how far we get this time, OK? But first, there's a clue. Who's this? A picture of? It's not me as a younger man. <laughs> Turing. Alan Turing, right? The Bletchley Park guy. Saved the planet, allegedly. Star of the recent movie, etc., etc. So here's the sequence that's going up just for a nanosecond. So who can tell me what the third last letter was, which would be either of our record breakers here? A. A, right? And so, thank goodness I wasn't at Bletchley Park, related to this. What's the connection? What's the secret code that the uh, Nazi war machine was using? Each, each letter's knocked up by just one. Right? Thank goodness I wasn't at Bletchley Park. The point of that little exercise, apart from giving away one of only three copies in existence, ladies and gentlemen, of the uh, best-selling book, was that many phenomena that look complex to us are not. Right? 
including strategy. There is what the physicist David Baum calls a hidden order. When you know the code, it's relatively easy. The first string of letters which appears random to us and doesn't compute, even for our language specialists in the room, is not in Greek or even in British Sign Language. It's not something that we recognize. But the second one, you only need just enough time to glimpse it, and we get the memory that, thank goodness I was, so this third last letter must be park ends into da da do Because we've got a lifetime of experience to bring to that. Okay? And I would suggest to you that when we look at behavior of firms, in strategic terms, we are often looking through that slightly muddled lens without the hidden order. The hidden order of strategy is a set of 12 interlocking choices that you make. We were discussing on the way in why you remember things, and often we remember things better if they're set to music, so I was going to do this as the 12 days of Christmas, but we'll not do that, right? But the 12 interlocking choices for strategy set out in the soon-to-be best-selling book are these. Now, I won't bore you with all of them. You can read that when you finally get a hold of the second copy of the book, right? We'll use one as an example. <laughs> Number six on this list is the aim of the strategy, which we define as one of three simple choices. Is this organization, it might be a university, it might be a charity, it might be a health service, or even, heaven forfend, Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs, is it trying to grow, is it trying to consolidate, or is it trying to retrench? These are the only three choices available to you. All 12 of the choices on this list are of that type. They're fixed responses. And as I said, the physicist David Baum would call that <coughs> implicate order. Noam Chomsky, the linguist, would call that the deep structure. Stuart Kaufman, the evolutionary biologist from the Santa Fe Institute, would call that order for free. Once you know the code, it's not difficult, OK? So here's an example of a strategy from a business that myself and my co-author Donald McLean worked with over an extended period of time. And I'll give you just a moment to read that uh, example of a strategy. The challenge we face is in our core markets not growing, our strategy is therefore to become a leading player in our sector. This strategy will be delivered through a combination of market development and the acquisition of competitors to achieve economies of scale, etc., etc. So where in this short statement are the 12 key decisions that form a complete, logically coherent, robust strategy? The first of the 12 things on the list that was up there before was the diagnosis. So where in this is the diagnosis of a challenge facing the organization? Well, the challenge is that their core market is not growing. This is a business which faced a marketplace a few years ago, which was flatlining, which is not a good thing for a commercial organization, which is what this was. The second of the 12 decisions was what's the strategic intent of the strategy? And this appears in three places in this statement. It says we want to become the leading player in our sector. Lots of organizations say that. We want to become the dominant player. Dominant and leading are very close synonyms of each other. You might say that one of those two statements could be deleted out as a redundant. But Poetically, it reads slightly better with it in twice. And they also say we want to achieve a growth in turnover to at least 25 millions. So intent is there. Third up is a time frame. Strategy is generally about the longer term. Bear in mind that this example was written about four or five or six years ago. So the period 2015 was at the time that this was written a reasonably long way away. Our 2013 to 2018 strategy covers a five-year period and was written before the year 2013, allegedly during the time phase when I was supposedly recruited to this institution. Okay. Next up is the capability, so the skill set, the resources, would be the, the phrase the strategy literature would use. What does it say about that? Well, it says, this firm has a superior ability to manage cost out of the production process, and they were exceptionally good at that. So that's what this business is good at. Next up, what's the opportunity that they see in the marketplace? Bear in mind that the marketplace is flatlining. What's the opportunity that they see? They see economies of scale. So the larger they get, the more they'll be able to deliver economies of scale. And in so doing, by investing in good uh, new uh, production machinery, produce high quality, consistent goods at low production costs. 
What's the aim of the strategy? Remember, that was number six on our list. That was the one that had only three choices. Are they trying to grow, to consolidate, or to retrench? Well, it says they want this is a growth strategy. What tactic did they deploy? In this case, it's market development. That's from the Ansoff matrix for those of you that are strategy scholars. It's not difficult stuff. It's just packaged together in a particular way. What method will they use to execute that? Acquisition. The other choices for the method used to execute are be, would be that they could grow organically, which they could have done, or they could partner with somebody. But in this case, they said, actually, to do this fast enough, what we need to do is eliminate the other failing businesses from our stagnating market in order to become the dominant player. What competitive stance do they adopt? They'll compete on the basis of cost. Again, the competitive stance is one of these choices where you're limited to, in our case, four choices. But theirs is a cost-based stance. And which strategic group? will they be in? Strategic groups is a technique from the strategy literature which basically identifies who are your peer group of similar companies. The argument would be that, for example, not all universities are the same and that Heriot Watt is the same as a bunch within its strategic group but not the same as others who are maybe smaller or less research intensive and not the same as others who are larger and maybe more uh, established. And this strategy says we'll do this within our strategic group. So to deliver this strategy, we will stay competing with the kinds of businesses that we currently compete with. And what is it they offer out into the world? They offer out consistently high standard goods at low cost of production. Final choice, which audience are they trying to address with this offering? Their current target customers. They're not looking for new customers in new places with different needs. They're looking to satisfy the demands of their existing customers. So question two was, how do you build a strategy? Now that we've defined what strategy is all about, it's this unexplained outcome. Our answer is that you build it in the way that I've just described. It's a set of 12 interlocking decisions, 12 step process. It's actually reasonably mechanical and quick to do. Notice that's 122 words. It's not a doorstop of a document which you'll often see, and one of the things I liked about our university strategy is it's relatively short. You could produce a doorstop from this by taking each of these 12 decision points and writing a few pages about our competitive stance or our competitor group, or, but it's short and succinct. It's logically complete, it's robust, it's coherent, it's clear, it's quick to deliver. If you want the longer version, you can write that for other purposes, maybe for a business plan. If you want the shorter world's favourite airline, you can do a strap line. Doing either of those two things, the very short or the very long version, in the absence of all 12 decisions being in place, is in my professional view a dangerous choice. Because you haven't covered off all of the things you need to think about. So as a small takeaway, you could take that framework and apply it to your own organisation strategy and give it a mark out of 12. They'll either be there or not, implicitly or explicitly, and you can assess a company's strategic behaviour. So question three in our list was, well, why do you need a strategy? Now the answer to question three has been implicit in our conversation thus far, in that we said strategy was defined as something which would explain unexpected outcomes. If you had Goliath at two to one on in the Bet365 market and David turns up, it's an unexpected outcome which is not helpful to you from your investment strategy. Why do you need a strategy? Well, I can tell you that there are three reasons that businesses generally develop strategies which are, in my view, not good reasons to develop a strategy. The first of them, as it says on the board, is habit. Steve said in his introductory comments, I sit on the board of a fabulous organisation called Turning Point Scotland that does just wonderful work with people in really difficult life circumstances. If you've never heard of them, go Google them. They're an amazing organisation. Turning Point Scotland strategy runs out in March 2015. There's this tremendous impetuous for them to think, we should probably get a new one of these. It's like a piece of cheese at the back of the fridge which has passed its sell-by date thinking, I never really planned to eat that, but I should replace it, you know? So 
building a strategy just because your old one is going out of date or because you usually do that at this time of year is not a good reason to build a strategy. Second reason that people often cite for developing a strategy is mimicry. Depending on your age group, it's the bell-bottom trousers, the uh, skateboard, the BMX bike, the grifter. It's the, all my pals have got Pokemons. I should have one. Right? It's not a good reason to have a strategy just because your pals have got one and you feel a bit embarrassed that you don't. But lots of businesses develop strategy on precisely that basis. And the third bad reason to develop a strategy is coercion. Big boy made me do it. Big boy might be a funder, an investor, a client, a regulator. The university in uh, January 2015 will be subject to a thing called the Enhancement-Led Institutional Review, or ELEA. It's very important. It's done by uh, an external body to the university, and it demands of us that we have a teaching and learning strategy. And I would say that's not a good reason for developing a teaching and learning strategy just because somebody said, you better get one. Not a good reason. There's only one good reason to develop a strategy, only one appropriate reason to develop a strategy, and it's this. If you have a problem, you probably should get a strategy. David had a problem. He was a tiddly little guy, and the other guy looked kind of grumpy and larger than expected. You might have first thought that it was a perspective issue, but as he gets closer, you think, he's nearly seven foot tall. He's killed loads of people, and I'm this size, about my build, you know, well honed, obviously. And I'm a shepherd. The Israeli uh, champion, Saul, offers him his armor, and David says no. Do you know why David says no? Because he couldn't lift it. <laughs> it's not going to go well. So he develops a strategy. <clears throat> Maybe he suggested the Sudoku strategy first, but he develops a strategy to overcome a difficult problem. Go back to the definition we offered at the beginning. Strategy is something that explains an unexpected outcome when faced with a significant challenge. So we're going to use a couple of businesses. From my disclaimer, you'll have gathered that we'll talk about a couple of businesses. Um, I'd like you to think just for a moment to yourself I'm going to flash up the logo of this organization, which I'm sure the vast majority of you will know. What's the first word that comes into your mind, right? <laughs> now, put your hand in the air again for me, if you don't mind. If what you thought about was some variation on cheap or price or low cost or... And have a look around the room. Almost everybody, when they see a Ryanair logo, thinks, I know what that business does. What that business does is claim to take you from, say, Edinburgh to, let's say, Barcelona for €4.99. Euros That's what they claim, right? And then by the time you've paid for speedy boarding, taken a bag, decided that you didn't want to go actually to Bognor Regis and get the connecting bus, but you did actually want to go to Barcelona, paid to use the toilet, etc., 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 you may think that it's not quite so cheap, but I would contend to you that in terms of trying to assess the strategic behaviour of Ryanair, it is clear, consistent, coherent, precise, everybody knows what it's about. You might not like it, and in fact there may be people in the audience who would prefer, I've heard people say to me before, I would not fly with that organisation again if they were paying me, <laughs> but they are at least clear and concise and consistent. Right? I'm going to put up another very well-known business and ask you to do the same thing. Think of what word would you associate with this with? Now, we don't really, if I had a giant whiteboard, I could ask you to all write them down. But I'm pretty sure there'd be a much greater ambiguity or diversity in our views about what Microsoft is all about. You might have thought that it's big and corporate and software and control, alt, delete and task manager. And this was, until relatively recently, the most valuable organization on the planet. It made a huge, huge amount of money. Bill Gates, the chief executive, the founding chief executive of Microsoft, he's now retired, was asked in an interview with the BBC by none other than Jeremy Paxman before he departed the scene. The following question is, Paxman says, Mr. Gates, somebody has calculated that if such a thing existed as a $20,000 note and you dropped one, 
it really wouldn't be worth your while to bend down and pick it up because you'd make $20,000 in the time that that took. <coughs> Mr. Gates, who's nobody's fool, says, of course, Jeremy, but if I bend down and pick it up, I've made $40,000. <laughs> now, fair play to Mr. Gates. He's gone on to say he doesn't want to leave that astronomical wealth to his children. He's trying to eradicate malaria from the world. That's a great thing to do. What he's left is an organization which, in my estimation, under its new chief executive who joined in July, that's the third attempt to replace Bill Gates, he's left an organization which does not know its strategic place in the world. Okay? So let's just take a little look at some of the things that Microsoft has done in the relatively recent past. <coughs> Recognize this logo, Skype. Okay? In 2011, Microsoft bought Skype for $8.5 billion. It's not the first time Skype had been sold. It's made lots of money for the originators of the voice over internet protocol that it uses. But as a business, Skype has never made money. Another little quiz question. Hand up if you use Skype. I use it a lot, right? Keep your hand up if you pay Skype premium. Yeah, there's only a couple of us mugs in the room, right? <laughs> Of the something like 6 million users of Skype for the 2 billion minutes of Skype conversation that have happened since it was first introduced, 1% of us pay the fee. Nokia, Microsoft in 2013 paid $7.5 billion for Nokia on the basis that it noticed the world was going mobile and, hmm, so let's buy the world's favorite smartphone company, so long as you write Apple and Android out of the equation. There may be people, because this demographic in the room is slightly older than many of the students that I deal with, who remember Nokia with their little fold up. Ooh, I quite like that. You know? Nokia has been failing quite badly. In fact, having paid $7.5 billion just last calendar year, Microsoft took the decision in about July or August of this year to withdraw the Nokia brand. So the Lumia phones that are in the car phone warehouse and various other places just now are the last Nokia handsets you will see. And then, in 2014, they paid two and a half billion dollars for Minecraft. Now, most of you are slightly too old to know what Minecraft's about, but these youngsters here, they probably do know what <coughs> Minecraft is all about, right? They paid two and a half billion dollars for this phenomena that children play, that have conventions, that makes you know, and the founders left. And I would suggest to you that these are indications that Microsoft does not really know its place in the world. It's noticed we've gone cloud. It's noticed we don't really like to pay for software licenses anymore. It's noticed that Apple hit it over the head. It's noticed that freeware and open office are eating it alive. And it's desperately trying to find something to replace it with. Put yourself in the shoes of a Microsoft shareholder you might think, hey, that's a lot of money. It doesn't look very effective to me. Bear in mind that Microsoft has more cash in the bank than the United Kingdom. That's not necessarily that hard, given our recent past, <laughs> but you know. So ask ourselves the question, does Microsoft have a strategy? Because I would contend to you that Ryanair clearly does have a strategy. Right? I'm not sure. I think that's too hard a question. Scrap that question. Here's a better question for the new chief executive of Microsoft. What problem do you think you are facing? Let's not build a strategy till we know what it's to try and overcome. David knew what he was facing. I don't think that Microsoft is that clear about what it's facing. At best, it's poorly articulated strategic problem at the moment strikes me as being a relevance problem. People don't need us anymore. If we get these youngsters playing Minecraft with a Microsoft logo in the corner, That'll hook them in and I'll find a way of making money out of them. Maybe if I get myself onto mobile handsets, that hasn't gone so well. Maybe if I get people using a free service where I pay them to make calls. Doesn't have a strategy in my opinion. Fourth question I wanted to ask this evening is, so are all strategists the same? Microsoft appointed a new chief executive in July of this year. So is he just the same as all the other strategists? Steve Ballmer who preceded him or Bill Gates who preceded him? Are they all the same? 
Well, the research that myself and Donald McLean have done over the last five or ten years indicates that strategists are distinctly different. They think about things differently. Here's a strategist, the late Steve Jobs, in 2001 launching the world's first iPod. I've got one of those in a drawer at home. It doesn't work anymore, but I hang on to it for sentimental reasons. Here's Steve Jobs, and the key bit is he says, we've been looking around and we think the digital music market is going to be huge. Turned out he was right. They weren't first to market, but he did spot the trend. So the first type of strategy, style that you can have, is what we call a trend-driven strategist. Somebody who looks out into the future and says, that's going to be a big thing, and gets in early. In fact, if I had to describe Apple's strategic competence or skill set, it's the, they are, I think, the best second-to-market company you'll come across. They don't go first, they wait for some other schmuck to make all the expensive mistakes and then they productize it and make you think it's worth three times more than the average market price. Here's another strategist, F. Williams is slightly less well known, but he's a serial tech entrepreneur who invented the blogger tool, sold that out, invented a few other things. This is a quote from an interview in the Guardian newspaper in 2006, the day that Twitter was launched. And notice what he says, well, as things grow, the business model and the revenue will fit in. He was asked the question, do you see this making any money, Ev? And he said, I don't honestly know. At some point, we'll figure out what it's useful for, and then we'll find a way of monetizing it. Right? That's a very different way of thinking about strategy than the Steve Jobs trend-driven. That's what we would call strategy style number two, a resource-driven strategy. It is to quote that dreadful Kevin Costner film, build it and they will come. <coughs> we have this stuff, somebody must want it. Here's our third strategist, John F. Kennedy. Quite timely given that we're back into the space race and heading to Mars and landing on meteors. And I believe this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a moon on the moon, man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. Now, if you're an American astronaut in 1961 working in the space program, the critical part of this is the returning him safely to <laughs> Earth. Because the American astronauts had noticed that the Soviet cosmonauts had sent a dog into space. She never came home. <laughs> right? So landing a man on the moon and then saying, see ya, have a nice one. Don't forget to tweet. Not so good, right? But what does he say? He says, we should commit to achieving the goal. At the point in May 1961 when Kennedy says this, his advisors behind the scenes are saying, <coughs> don't know if we can do that, boss. But it's a public statement of ambition. And so strategy style number three is what we would call an intent-driven strategy. We're going to be the fastest growing, the world's favorite, the most reliable, okay? Bill Gates, when he founded Microsoft, there'll be a computer in every home. Everybody thought he was a nut. But in actual fact, he undershot by quite a significant factor because there's a computer in every home, in every pocket, in every car. Right? So over the last couple of years, myself and Donald McLean have been commercializing uh, some of the intellectual property around this. Uh, which you'll find in the App Store. It landed today in the App Store, and the website will go online where there's a diagnostic where you can do this stuff. You can answer a set of questions, and it will profile you. And in January 2015, when that goes live, you'll get the chance to see what kind of strategic thinking you do, as well as to use the 12-step builder that we introduced earlier. So our final question of the evening, heading into the home straight, ding, ding on the last lap. What do strategists do then? Strategists, incidentally, are not only it's the most important subject, they are by far the cleverest people in the room, right? <laughs> Said the professor of strategy. I'd like to think there's a certain allure about my subject here. <laughs> if you doubt me, and I can tell from your sniggers that some of you doubt me, ask what people do with the word strategy and its various derivatives and synonyms. People don't say when something goes wrong, well, oh, that's a shame. Maybe we should have a think about that. They say, let's undertake a strategic review. Right. Take strategy or strategically or strategic 
and scatter it over your CV and your narrative of yourself, I guarantee you'll double your salary. You'll find yourself running stuff because people say, he looks like a strategic thinker. <laughs> Very few chief executives that I have interviewed, and I've interviewed lots of them now, pitch up and say, well, my job was just to hold the jackets and hope nothing went wrong. <laughs> They mostly say, oh no, I undertook a strategic review. I thought about this strategically and we set off in that direction. So what do strategists actually do? In order to answer that, I need to introduce for the first time tonight just a little bit of theory. But it's not strategy theory per se. It comes from a body of work on complexity theory, which Donald and I wrote up a long time ago in an article for the Strategic Management Journal, and which Cathy Eisenhart and Donald Sewell Kathy Eisenhart from Stanford and is one of the world's top strategy scholars, Donald Sewell's at London Business School. They wrote up in the Harvard Business Review in 2001 and then again more recently in 2012. Simple rules is the idea of hidden order, as we discussed earlier. Here's a picture of uh, Glasgow's George Square in the Christmas season. Christmas lights have obviously not been paid for that year because the lights aren't yet on. For those of you familiar with the city of Glasgow, what you see in George Square is the UK traffic system in operation. What you notice in that corner there is a traffic light which is about to go green. When it goes green, traffic will proceed until it goes red again and it'll stop. There's a street that comes up in that direction which will be waiting whilst that light is green. If you wanted to explain the UK traffic system to somebody who was unfamiliar with the concept, here's the simple rule that would be in operation. It's the highway code. It's a obey the traffic signals. Don't speed, stop when it says red, be polite and wait for the green man and all of that stuff. Here's a picture I took when I was at the Strategic Management Society in Rome in 2010. <laughs> it's a fundamentally different traffic system. I know this because I was stranded on a pavement for about four and a half days of the conference. <laughs> I waited for the green man like a naive Scot. <laughs> oh. And as I launched forward, from the pavement, it was taken off by the first car, and so I chickened out. And then the red man came back up, and that process repeated over most of the afternoon. <laughs> what you see in the Italian, or at least the Roman traffic system, is the following simple rule. If you see a space, <laughs> follow it. Look at what's happening in this picture, right? These guys on the mopeds have spotted just a nanosecond of a gap between the oncoming traffic and thought, go for it! And when the first one goes, they all go. <laughs> There's a lot of <laughs> going on. It's some kind of communication device. <laughs> At some point, the guy in that car is probably going to see that gap there and think, oh, stuff this. I'm already late. I'm going to take one of those guys down. <laughs> stuff my insurance claims. And he'll go, and when he goes, these guys are all going, yes, follow him. And it's a survival of the fittest, there are no prisoners taken kind of a society. If you approach that traffic system with this rule set, you spend a lot of inert time. I can tell you even as a pedestrian, you spend a lot of inert time because you can't engage. So we've got this idea that very complex patterns can be explained by very simple rules, okay? Here's how that applies in organizational life. Organizations are driven by two strands in their DNA. There's one set of simple rules which relate to their business behavior. Which kind of markets are we in? What kind of risk are we willing to uh, expose ourselves to? What kind of margins do we expect to, re to receive? What's our relationship to intellectual property? Okay? And that drives one particular set of outcomes. Should we license this product? Well, no, because we always hang on to IP. Apple, I'm using an Apple machine just now, very, very vehement that they always manage both the software and the hardware. Microsoft had a fundamentally different take, as did the PC industry. Then there's a second strand in the DNA loop, which isn't about business rules. It's about organizational or cultural rules of thumb. They are, what does it mean to be one of us? Why are we here? What kind of folk do we hire? How do we promote? What do we reward? What's bad behavior like? And every single time we take a decision, as it indicates here, these two strands of our <coughs> DNA get into some kind of tension. <coughs> that looks really lucrative, but it's the kind of business that we don't generally do because we won't control it. He looks like a great guy or girl to, to, uh, to take into this role, but they don't fit with our values. Okay? And so every time we make a decision, what we see is that patterning in our decision. 
So we call that the strategy cycle, and I'll just very quickly walk you through that before we wrap up. So here's how strategy happens in my estimation. A group of people, typically the senior people in the organization, but not always exclusively the senior people, sit in a room, often in a very nice location. I have to say, Harriet Watt, my colleagues in SML, we failed spectacularly because we went to the Lord Balerno building. It's not quite Glen Eagles, but it's close. It's close to our building anyway. Um, and they think about some imagined future state. We'd like to be like this by the year 2018. In our case, as our school, it's been about imagining ourselves into the next REF assessment cycle for 2020. And we develop a carefully crafted plan, which is delivered through these 12 kinds of decisions. Okay. And what happens thereafter, as Steve said in his introductory comments, is that carefully crafted plan interacts with the lived experience of trying to do that. 80% of the time, that results in the plan going in the wheelie bin. And so that drives a process of experimentation and innovation as you begin to think, oh, I really thought that would work, but it hasn't, so what else are we going to do? And as that happens, the strategists are doing what the literature calls sense-making. They're trying to make sense of the signals they're receiving from each other and from the environment <coughs> around them. And as they're doing that, they're comparing their long-term history, their recent past circumstances, this imagined future state that they have for themselves. And now we can answer our question, what do strategists do? They begin to talk about what they're experiencing in relation to things like measures, targets, KPIs, outcome agreements. How is this going? And that produces a feedback loop into the imagined future state, if we go back up to here. And they also talk about what does this mean? So why is this happening to us? How do I feel about it? What does it tell us? They talk in metaphors and in stories and heroes and villains and good guys and bad guys. And that's the strategy cycle. We go round and round that loop as we try to take the strategic plan that we thought of, our carefully crafted plan, into being in the real world. We call that the strategy cycle. So we can now answer our fifth and final question. What is it that strategists do from 20 years of studying them? You're going to think it took a long time to get that, Robert, right? But here's what they do. They talk. 90% of the time, what strategists are engaged with is talking. Why is this like this? What's happening? What's good about this? Can we see any opportunities? Don't worry about, think about. They talk to themselves, they talk to their peers, they talk to their stakeholders, they sometimes talk to their competitors. And going back to our examples of Microsoft and Ryanair, when there's consistency in that talk, it generally means it's working. And when the talk is all over the place and conflicted and there are conflicting narratives, it generally means this is not working well. So, conclusions. Where, do, where does all of that take us? Strategy is not the development of the 12-step program. It's not the one-paragraph statement in isolation. It's not just planning. Here's a quote which is often attributed to Mike Tyson, but when I was researching for the book, discovered that it was actually attributable to a guy called Joe Lewis, the Brown Bomber, the, one of the heavyweight champions in the early part of the last uh, century. And the interviewer says, oh, this guy you're coming up against, he thinks he's got a plan to, kick, to, to win the fight, to which the blunt and it says, yeah, they all say they got a plan until I punched them in the face, right? <laughs> which is an echo of the thing which comes from a German military strategist that Steve quoted earlier called Moltke, who says, plans rarely survive first contact with the enemy. Okay. So strategy is, if it's not just planning, this. This is the closing sentence of the book. So we've gone from the opening sentence to the closing sentence of the book. It's part art. It's part science. The science part is the logic of these 12 decisions. The art part is the narrating into being a compelling story about what you're doing. It's part plan, so the plan is important, but it's not the totality because it's also part poetry. That's why the world's favorite airline or the, those kinds of strapline versions are important because they capture the soul of somebody. It's part chieftain. Mostly strategists are thought of as the chief executive, the head honcho, 
the big guy, the big cheese. It's often male, it's usually white, it's usually of a certain age. That is changing slowly, but not nearly fast enough. The general, the president, the chief executive. Right? But it's also part storyteller. It's also part cultural historian of the organization. And to use the phrase that connects us back to the beginning, it's also part bard. In Celtic traditions, the bard was the conjoined part of the management team for the clan because the chieftain made the big decisions, right, we're going to fight with those guys at three o'clock. It's actually still quite like that in some parts of uh, Scotland's footballing community. Um, but alongside those big decisions, whether we won or lost, whether it was a fair fight or not, was the bard's job. And bards were trained to tell these long, <coughs> often verbal or oral stories about who we are and why that was an important battle and why those cheats didn't win. Think about the relationship between the McDonald's and the Campbell's in Scotland. It cuts deep, that stuff, right? And it cuts deep for a reason. So revealed, says the book in its final sentence, at last then, this is the true nature of the strategist at work. You are part cunning plan, part storyteller. It's interesting to me that in the last several years, Coca-Cola and a handful of other very, very large corporate organizations have employed historians to manage the cultural apparatus of the organization's past. Okay. And I said, when Burns came back, we were nearly good to go. Right. So I'll close with a quote from Burns to a lady friend of his. It wasn't a poem, it was a letter. And he says, this appellation of the Scots Bard, which is what we say about Burns once a year when we're having haggis, is by far my highest pride. And I think he's absolutely on the money. Because for the strategist, this ability to tell a compelling story married to this ability to build a logically robust, comprehensive strategy, married to the ability to improvise and tell the story in real time in a way that inspires people, is what strategy is all about. If you're interested in any of this stuff, you'll find me in any of these places. And at that, I'm going to stop. Before I stop completely and allow for, I've told my children, this is the first time my wife and children have seen me teach. I have to tell you that in that sense, this is the only thing that's inaugural about this evening's talk, because from Steve, we know that I've been here since 1926 and <laughs> that I've been a professor since I was four. So neither of those are inaugural, but it's the first time they've seen me speak. And so I also have to ask you to collude with me in a small illusion. I've usually tell them there's gales of applause, you know, I get asked for an encore, people ask for autographs. Anything you can do to help me out here, folks, would be really much appreciated. But I asked you on the way in to put your business card into here for a prize draw. So can I can ask my lovely little daughter, Eva, would you mind picking out a winning card? Oh. Let's see, who did we get? Eugene Lucarelli. At the back, you've won yourself a book, Eugene, there you go. 